Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So um, I mean, what, what specifically in Keynes really got you interested in this subject? Um, uh, and what was the trigger? Well, the trigger was this. Um, in 1930, Keynes wrote a little essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And it was in the depth of the Depression. Um, but he said, I want to take wing into the future. What will life be like in 100 years' time? Um, given the fact that uh, technology is always progressing and um, people are getting wealthier. Uh, what sort of lives will they lead? And so he made a couple of um, pretty remarkable predictions. He said if things go on more or less as they are now, in about 100 years' time, that is coming close to where we are today in our grandchildren's time, we would be four or five times as rich as we were then in 1930. And, and because that amount of uh, production would be obtainable at a very small fraction of the effort um, which was then being employed in production because you know there'd be automation and things, he thought that uh, we wouldn't have to work more than 15 hours a day. Okay. We we uh, 15, 15 hours a week. <laughs> 15 <laughs> hours a day is another question. Yeah. And it's quite striking um, that Keynes was so nearly right about yeah. growth. Yeah. Um, I mean, he got that pretty much spot on, but, but so wrong about working hours. Yeah. I would just say one more thing okay. about working yeah. hours, which is um, that um, the rich often work the hardest of all. I don't think they work harder than other people, but the rich certainly work hard. So we talk a lot about the greedy rich, now, but very few people talk about the idle rich. Um, and so that's, that's contrary to what people expect. Because, you know, rich people, the old aristocrats, they weren't expected to work at all. Yeah, and that, I mean, and in a sense, I mean, Keynes's um, prophecy was, was, I mean, it was quite standard among economists at the time. They expected that, you know, as people became more productive, so they'd naturally work less. Um, uh, you know, as they were able to produce everything they needed in shorter and shorter hours, they'd do so. So what, what went wrong? I mean, why, why didn't it work out as Keynes thought? How can we explain this? Well, I think he made a number of, he made a number of errors in his, there were a number of errors in his thinking. First of all, he thought that wants were finite, and that once we had reached a certain level in which all our needs were um, satisfied, we would ease off, we would sort of trade work for more leisure. That seemed to him to be the rational thing to do. Um, but in fact, what happened was, it turns out, we now realize, that wants are pretty insatiable. And the reason they're insatiable is because they're relative. We're always comparing our fortune to others and in some way finding it wanting. I mean, a good example of that is the cons conspicuous consumption, especially of the new rich. They simply want others to know how rich they are. And then others get envious of the how rich they are, and they want to be richer still and have mo even more conspicuous consumption. Secondly, I think, our civilization puts us under tremendous pressure to consume. It's a competitive consumption drive. I mean, first of all, it is a very competitive civilization. And secondly, there is this uh, constant advertising pressure to find your souls in your shopping. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. I think there's a third factor as well, and that is that we're not, or most of us, aren't quite as rich or wealthy or well-off as the average figures suggest. There's a crucial distinction, which um, I think you, one has to grasp, between the average or mean and the median incomes. The average incomes, the average incomes in the UK, average income is 27,000 pounds a year per disposable income per household. But the, me the median is only 21,000. 
The official poverty line is 60% of the 21,000, 60% of the median income. That's, uh, that's defined as the poverty line, which is uh, 13,000 a year. And there are 13 million people in this country below that poverty line. So although average income is maybe enough, there are a, lot of, a hell of a lot of people who haven't got av the average income. And they're still trying um, to, to, get, um, to get an income that would, would, would um, uh, give them a good life. And then there was also, I think, a more philosophical explanation of Keynes's mistake, if you like. Uh, as we said before, he, he was grounded in a philosophical tradition in which you, you, you tended to think about wealth as a means to something else rather than an end itself. He was well educated in a way economists aren't today, and particularly in the Greeks and Aristotle. Yeah. He knew that very well. <laughs> and th I mean, this is where it links in with um, the things I'm interested in. Um, I mean, in, in, um, in his book, The Politics, um, Aristotle talks quite a lot about money and wealth, and he, he makes a very interesting distinction between two kinds of money making. Uh, one he calls a natural kind, and then another he calls an unnatural kind. And the natural kind of money making is when you make just enough to sustain a good way of life. Um, so for Aristotle, this would have meant the life of an Athenian country gentleman with a few acres, some vineyards, some olive groves. And once you've got enough for this, you stopped accumulating. That was the sort of the rational thing to do. Um, but then there's also, he says, a, an unnatural kind of uh, money making where you just go on wanting more and more and more um, uh, in regardless of what you actually need uh, you become insatiable and and for Aristotle it was money that uh, was really the serpent in the garden here I mean money has this odd property that you just want more and more of it um, and this isn't true of concrete goods um, I mean to go on collecting more and more I don't know beds say would just be plain irrational be crazy um, you only need so many beds. But once you start calculating your wealth in terms of money rather than concrete goods, there is this tendency to just want more and more and more of it. And he doesn't say why. Um, he just observes it. He quotes, he quotes um, the uh, great Athenian lawgiver, Solon. No bounds to riches have been fixed for man. Um, so wealth has a natural limit, uh, which is what we need to lead a good life. But there's something in human nature that tends always to surpass these limits, to want more and more. And these ideas were hugely influential um, throughout the Middle Ages and well into the modern era. But all these cultures had some notion of a good life, uh, a life that's objectively desirable in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And they all thought of money as a means yeah. to the end of a good life. Well, of course, uh, some, some economists have tried to revive this idea um, of money simply as a means to something else. But when you ask them, well, what is that something else? They say happiness. Yeah. And happiness studies are, are, are big now. They're, 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 they're big in politics, big in the United Nations. But we, we really thought that that was not the right answer, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, the trouble is, we, I mean, we're a bit skeptical of the attempt to, um, to measure happiness. I think and there's an even more fundamental problem with this whole enterprise of trying to maximize happiness. And that is this. Is, is happiness really something we want to be maximizing? Um, I mean, surely it all depends what you're happy about. Um, uh, I mean, think of, uh, just to take an example, this is actually uh, a real life example. I was friends with someone as a student, and, um, and he, was, he, was, he was heading for a failure. Um, uh, you know, he, 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 he was going to fail all his exams. That was obvious. But um, he was on a, a very strong dose of Prozac. Um, so he seemed happily oblivious to this fact. <laughs> uh, you know, when I asked him, he said, oh, it's all going fine, uh, no problem at all. So, so he, was, he, was, he was happy. Um, but, I mean, surely it would have been better for him not to be happy in that situation. <laughs> um, you know, he had no reason to be happy. So when do you have good reason to be happy? When it's when your life is going well. Um, you know, when you have the good things of life. Yeah, um, and, yeah. But, but then, so, I mean, we, I think we rapidly came to the conclusion that as, as, a, as an end, happiness was vacuous. It had to have, s there had to be some concrete things 
um, uh, to be happy about, uh, just as there were to be sad about. But if happiness isn't the goal, what is? Well, we, we, um, I mean, we go back to this old Greek notion of, of eudaimonia, as it was called. And this is often translated happiness, but it's not really. It really means something more like the good life. And the point is, we think this is something you can actually give some objective content to. So it's not just a matter of what you want. Um, I mean, if you ask an economist what the good life is, they say, well, it depends what your tastes are. You know, to some people, the good life is living in a little country cottage in Wales and growing your own vegetables. For others, it's... Uh, and not just an economist. Okay. It's true of liberals in yeah, general, I mean, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is the standard liberal view. You know, for others, it's you know, owning a yacht in the Mediterranean. And I don't know if you saw um, that film Shame that came out recently, a very good film about someone whose uh, you know, sex life just consists of random casual encounters with, with prostitutes and so forth. Um, now, he's, um, you know, all these are consensual encounters, so he's not, he's not violating the law, he's not coercing anyone, his utility is maximized, I and mean, this is presumably how he wants to be living, but I think we could say it's, a, it's an empty life, there's something unsatisfactory about it. Um, so we think you can actually say something objective about the good life, and in chapter six of our book, we try to spell out what the good life involves, um, and we come up with seven what we call basic goods, um, health, respect, security, personality, harmony with nature, friendship, and leisure. And we think these seven goods together make up a good life. So if you enjoy these seven basic goods, you have a good life. If you lack one or more of them, you are injured or harmed in some way, even if you're not aware of the fact. <laughs> one, of the, one of the most important of these basic goods, and, and one that's often misunderstood, is leisure. This is our last category. And, you know, and often when we say we're advocates for greater leisure, people think, oh, you want people to just slack off and watch TV all day. And uh, you know, surely work is the one thing that keeps us sort of active and energetic and aspiring. OK, this is not what we mean by leisure. Um, so we distinguish leisure from mere recreation or rest. Uh, leisure, as we use the term, means doing things for their own sake rather than as a means to an end. Um, so leisure could be highly strenuous. I mean, leisure could be writing a book, learning to play a musical instrument, um, painting, um, all these things. I mean, one of them which, which comes first, really, in our, in our list is health. And we, we, don't, have, we don't think of health um, simply in terms of extending the years of life, longevity, because that's become a proxy for welfare measures. Uh, uh, and and it's very important, obviously. I mean, people were worn out earlier on and died much sooner. So in a way, they didn't enjoy their, their full lifespan. Um, but um, on the other hand, we're a bit suspicious, aren't we, of this idea that pe people, uh, w the idea which modern science has made possible, that we can keep people going almost indefinitely um, just by equipping them with spare parts and sort of other, other, other ways, uh, until 100, 150, 200, immortality, irrespective of the quality of their life. Yeah, yeah we think, I mean, we think lifespan is not a good proxy for health um, because you can live a very long life, but it can still be a pretty unhealthy life. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily a good trade-off uh, in our view. So well, I mean, what can government do? Well, first of all, I think, I think there are two, two things um, that um, government has to pay attention to. <coughs> One is to deal with the problem that um, we discussed originally, that a lot of people aren't, in fact, in a position, even in rich societies, to lead a good life. They just don't have enough. They're in poverty. And, and that has to be uh, addressed. That's, of course, going beyond the rich countries of the world. That's true of a billion or two billion people in, in the developing countries. So for them, growth of GDP in this classic sense is still a very important objective. In rich countries, it's not so much a matter of, 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 of growth um, as a matter of redistribution. And instead of redistribution, we offer people debt. And of course, that is a very, very uh, insecure way of um, getting enough. On, on the question of... Um, work and trying to reduce the hours of work, we're taking redistribution as, as a given factor that, 
that is, is part of all this. You can, um, you can have um, more, much more work sharing. At the moment, we tend to divide our society into people who have worked too hard, often against their will, and people who are sort of unemployed, don't work at all, about 15, 20% of, of the Brits. Another would be um, uh, an unconditional citizen's income which is a proposal that's long been around. It's all we've always thought, you know, there have always been objections to it. Um, uh, it would reduce the incentive to work, people have said. Well, of course, that's one of its merits in, 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 our, in our view of things. On the reduction of consumption side, I think one thing uh, we clearly need to do um, is to limit the extent of advertising. Yeah. Um, Without, without being coercive. Now, I think we, we, you, you want to say something about advertising. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean advertising is obviously one of the main drivers of, of, of consumption in our society. Um, economists, oddly enough, deny this. Um, they say the role of advertising is purely informational, okay? It just gives us information about products to enable us to better satisfy our wants. So you know, we come to the market with a set of wants. We you know we look at the adverts to work out what will best satisfy them. Now I think you know this is clearly rubbish. Um, <laughs> and I mean, just to give you a couple of illustrations, I mean this uh, you probably remember this famous uh, silk cut advertising campaign. Now what information does that convey? Uh, n none whatsoever. It uh, it doesn't tell you anything. In fact, it doesn't even mention silk cut on the advertisement. Here's another example. Uh, you know, this famous uh, iPod advertising campaign of a few years back. Again, it doesn't give you any information beyond the fact that you can listen to music on your iPod. What it does is it... Glamorous um, people have iPods. Yeah it, yeah, it tells you that cool people have iPods, and if you don't have one, you're not, you know, joining the party. Okay, so advertising clearly manipulates wants. Um, and if we want to restrain insatiability, um, I think one of the key ways to do that is to, is to put some restrictions on advertising. Yeah, and, and the restrictions, we already have restrictions on advertising. It's not a new principle. We already have restrictions. Certain goods are banned because we think they're harmful. Um, and um, in, in, in various countries, um, they, they have different ways of arranging television advertising. For example, in Scandinavia, they tend to bunch advertisements at the beginning and end of programs. So you don't, in order to watch the program, you don't have to watch the ad. Now, it, whatever you think of the proposals, and I think there are others, and these are not really advanced in a dogmatic spirit, unless you um, start thinking about these, one th starts thinking about these things, where are we going? Do we just go on and on and on? Does capitalism go on and on and on, accumulating and accumulating? To what end? And then to what end is this? Unless one starts thinking about things, I think we're on a hiding to nothing. And so it's really as an invitation to think about what the meaning of life is, what the purpose of making money is that we've written the book. 